Hi, so as you heard, my name's Tanya. I'm a senior uh, system administrator at Seek, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on a Slack app that I created that integrates with the Jamf Pro Classic API um, that I created in an aim to simplify Mac lookups and Mac troubleshooting. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of background as to uh, how the Slack app came about, what problem I was trying to solve. Um, then I'm going to step through how the app works, so the, the app workflow, uh, then the fundamentals of the AWS services that I use to make it happen, then the security fundamentals, so the, um, the, how I secured the app so that it was production ready, and then I'm going to spend about 10 minutes at the end just talking about some of the things that kept me up at night when, while I was creating the app, and uh, just a, a a couple of um, potential improvements that I can see the app making in the near future. So I started working at Seek uh, about two and a half years ago, a bit less than that, uh, with a fleet of about 350 Macs. Um, over the years, Seek has acquired a number of employment, volunteering and education businesses around the world. And early last year, it announced um, a, a change. And this change was that it would become a global entity. Um, so this new entity was, is called Seek Asia Pacific and Americas, Seek APNA. Uh, which means that Seek would now encompass uh, the Seek Asia um, companies, as well as Catho in Brazil and OCC in Mexico. Around the same time that APNA was ramping up, Seek Asia was starting to look at managing their fleet of about 170 unmanaged Macs, and that's where I became uh, heavily involved in helping them do that. Uh, so we've looked at a phased rollout of Jamf Pro across the, across the fleet. Uh, these Macs are located in seven different air, um, countries around Southeast Asia, and the, the um, Mac fleet is only 12% of the fleet in, in, in Seek Asia. So there was that additional challenge of working with level one and level two techs that didn't have as much experience troubleshooting macOS and didn't have as much um, training opportunities uh, to learn about macOS, um, uh, supporting macOS. So very early on, one of my main concerns was how can I help the level one and level two techs across multiple locations with varying levels of uh, experience, troubleshoot the Macs efficiently and effectively. So I was fairly optimistic to begin with. Um, I thought, Great, I'm going to give everyone read-only access to the Jamf console. I'm going to create the uh, Seek Asia-specific extension attributes and smart groups. I'm going to document the heck out of everything and give them this information, and uh, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> this optimism was short-lived as soon as I logged into the Jamf Pro console and saw that I was going to have to highlight the attributes in a sea of attributes. And not only was I going to have to tell them which attributes to look at, but also uh, qualify each one. So let them know what was a, a good extension attribute value and what was a bad one. And there's just really so much to look at. And really, the Jamf Pro console is very busy. And it's not particularly intuitive for a new user, for someone that's new to Jamf Pro, or for someone that's new to Mac OS. Um, if I was going to get them to look up the Jamf Pro console, then it doesn't really translate well to iOS. And so ultimately, I'm forcing them to be carrying around their laptops around every time they have to do a desk visit. That's not very practical either. Um, and the thing is that I want them to look up the Macs into, in Jamf Pro, because when you see that there's lots of useful information up there in the, um, in the console, right? Um, but as soon as you make something difficult to do, it means that they're li less likely to do it, which means that the level of support that the techs are going to be able to provide the users is going to be inconsistent. And it also means that they're missing out on an opportunity for proactive support. 
And what I mean by this is the fact that when you have a um, customer that has logged a support ticket because they can't print from their Mac, um, if you look up that Mac in Jamf Pro, you're going to find out perhaps that they've got some 32-bit apps that you know aren't going to be supported very soon. And so that's an opportunity to have that discussion. Or you might find out that their, their Mac hasn't actually done an inventory update or a check-in in quite some time, and there's something wrong with their Jamf enrollment, and you can fix it there and then, et cetera, et cetera. It just means that that 15-minute support ticket now becomes uh, an opportunity to resolve some future tickets that you don't have to worry about anymore. Um, so, with this in mind, I started looking at what kind of a solution I could, I could create. So, the Jamf Pro cl um, Classic API is a great way for me to pick and choose the exact attributes that I want the tech to consider when they're supporting a Mac. And I'm able to qualify um, the value, whether a particular value requires further investigation. Um, so, it's a lot of flexibility as to how I'm presenting the information that is in the Jamf Pro console. The next question for me was how I was going to present this information to the tech. I initially considered creating an iOS app. In fact, I actually went ahead and created an iOS app, and it was a hell of a lot of work. And uh, it got uh, became very clear to me at the end that um, it's not going to be easy to update. So I needed a solution that was easy to update. And also, forcing text to have an iOS app at all times was also not a very practical solution. So I needed something that um, they could easily access. Um, and Slack really ticked uh, all the boxes. So a Slack app gives you the ability to interact with a web app via Slack. Um, our use of Slack at Seek has uh, gro grown rapidly over the years. Um, it's the most effective way for us to contact our customers and for them to contact us. And it's also the primary um, means of communication with our Seek Asia colleagues. The Slack API documentation is very clear and helpful. Um, and it's specifically the Slack slash command that ticked all the boxes for what I was uh, wanting to, what I was wanting to do. So what is the Slack slash command? It's initiated by the user from the message box, and which means that it's super easy to use. And the user can provide parameter values to your app. So when the user clicks return, Slack sends a URL encoded payload to your app. Your app then has three seconds to respond with a 200 status code. Um, if it doesn't, then Slack tells the user that there's been a timeout error, and then that's the end of that. So that's pretty important to do that in those three seconds. Um, and then your app can also send, apart from that um, status code of 200, can also send some additional text. Um, in theory, you don't have to, but it's helpful to let the user know that uh, you as the app, you've, your app has been inv invoked, and that there's something happening. Um, by default, the text that you send back to the user can only see be seen by the user, even if they invoked the command in a public channel. So, in my app, Jamf, the Jamf command, the tech enters in the message box slash Jamf, followed by a search string. The search string is going to be used to do a match lookup. Um, and what this means is that it's going to do that API call, that, that get request. So all of those attributes there are what it's um, going to get uh, matched up against with that search string. So for example, in this case, the search string is tdastrous. If tdastrous exists in the computer name or the username or the first name, et cetera, then it's going to return <coughs> some results. So, in this case, the search string is t asterisk, and the app returns a status code of 200 and some text letting the user know that the app, that something's about to happen. And the app is going to return the search results, so all the matching max. And in the results, each uh, computer has a button for more information. So if the user clicks on that more info button, then the app returns a Mac health summary. Um, these, the Mac health summary are the attributes that we as seasoned Mac admins look at when we log into the Jamf Pro console, um, but it's 
nicely summarised um, there. So this is an example of it just uh, in movement. So three results. They choose the one that they're interested in. And there's the summary. So hopefully um, it's clear that this, the, the benefits of an app like this, that it's really easy to use, right? There's, there's practically no training required um, to teach a tech how to do this. Um, it's going to list the attributes that you are interested in them making sure are correct. The fact that you've got emojis there make it visually very clear which um, things require further investigation or which um, attributes require um, some, some, some further action. Um, so to make the app, uh, there are three components at play. The Jamf Pro Classic API, um, which is what I'm doing using to, to get the information. AWS Services is actually going to run the app. And Slack is where I'm installing the app in my company's workspace. The main AWS services that I'm using are Lambda, API Gateway, and SNS, a simple notification service. So Lambda is um, a serverless compute service, which means that it uh, runs the code without you having to worry about the server that's doing the um, execution of it. Uh, it natively supports that list of uh, languages, but it's also got a runtime API. So really, I think, in theoretically, any language that you're comfortable with, you'd be able to make it work um, with Lambda. The AWS spiel on API Gateway is that it's a service for creating, publishing, maintaining, monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. Um, essentially, what, what I'm using it for is I'm giving my Lambda function a URL so that when Slack sends that, um, that request payload, your, your Lambda function is going to receive it. Um, if you consider all the things that the Lambda function has to do within that three second um, time limit, it's quite a lot. So it has to respond with the status code of 200, it has to do that Jamf Pro lookup, it has to loop through the results and has to format it for Slack and add a button. All of that is, is, is much too much for one function to do in those three seconds. So instead, uh, it makes more sense to have two functions, one that primarily does the just returning the status code of 200, and then the second one that does all the grunt work without having to worry about that three second time limit. So a simple notification service is a push messaging service. Um, an SNS instance is called a topic, and it allows that first Lambda function to let the second Lambda function know that it has been invoked and that it's time for that second Lambda function to start doing some work. Uh, so that first function there is uh, responding to Slack with the status code of 200. Then it grabs the URL encoded um, payload that it's getting from Slack, converts it to JSON data, sends it to SNS, so it's publishing to that topic. And then the second Lambda function is subscribing to that topic, which means that it gets triggered. Um, at that point and gets the JSON data from Slack and is able to go ahead and, and get the job done. Um, topics are defined, oh, all Amazon uh, AWS resources are defined by an ARN, which is like a, a unique identifier. It's an Am Amazon resource name. Um, so that covers the main AWS services that I use. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out about AWS is its identity and access management. I guess I understood um, previously the access in a more traditional way, which is that you grant access to a particular user or a particular group or a particular token. Um, but another form is this role-based access, uh, which Amazon uses or AWS uses. So you, can, you create a role that has specific service permissions and resource permissions. So Lambda functions require an execution role. So as soon as you go in there to create a new Lambda function, you have to create a role that is specific to, that has permission to execute that, that function. Um, and so what you want to do is create a role that has that specific to your app workflow. Um, and so you just want to make sure that that role also has permission to publish and subscribe to your SNS topic and also any other AWS services that you may use. 
On the Slack side of things, everything's a lot more straightforward. So uh, it's pretty much a three-step process. Number one, you just tell Slack what the name is of your app um, and the workspace that you want to install it in. Then you tell it that you want to create a slash command. Um, so you give your command a name, a short description, a usage hint. The description and the usage hint are going to pop up um, to the user <laughs> as they type your command in, so it kind of auto-completes. So you want to make sure that the, what you put in there is fairly um, you know, descriptive information. The usage hint is specifically where you put in any parameter values that you're expecting from the user. Um, as a side note, two apps can have exactly the same command name, and what Slack is going to do is it's just going to choose whichever command was created most recently. So you want to make sure that your command name is fairly uh, descriptive, unique, not too vague, um, just to prevent someone else in your workspace from accidentally clobbering uh, your command. Uh, so the most important thing here is that request URL. So this is the URL where Slack is going to send the payload to when it gets invoked. The third step is to enable interactivity. Our interactive component is that button that shows up in the, with the computer results. So uh, once again, the most important thing is the re request URL. So this is where, as soon as that button gets clicked, where does Slack send that information to? So now let's just go over that app workflow again, just in a little bit more detail. Um, so the user's invoking the app with the search string tdastris again. As soon as they hit the return key, their Slack is going to get send some URL encoded data to that request URL um, that we specified. And API Gateway is going to give it all to your Lambda function. Our function's going to convert it to JSON, and it's also then going to return a status code of 200 back to Slack, as well as publish that, um, that topic, that SNS topic. I'm just going to jump into a little bit of code. Uh, so the data that it's uh, receiving from that command um, invocation is there, it's a URL encoded. Um, so that means that that first Lambda function is going to use something like the um, uh, URL pass module to be able to then convert it into uh, JSON data. Uh, here, this, this code block here is what is doing the triggering or the publishing of the SNS topic. Um, Bodo3 is the module that allows you to interact with AWS services. Um, you're identifying the topic via its topic ARN, and you're giving it the data that Slack has sent you in JSON format. Um, so here I'm grabbing, in that same function, I'm also grabbing the, um, the search string and looking for any asterisks. So some of you, most of you already know that if you have um, uh, uh, the text bookended by asterisks, Slack is going to convert that into bold text. We don't want that to happen. Uh, we want the asterisks to stay in asterisks, and so we're adding um, a, a Unicode character, the combining graphene joiner, a very ugly name, um, which means that Slack is just going to leave it like, as an asterisk. And then we're going to respond to Slack uh, and present that to the user, as well as give Slack that status code of 200. The SNS topic is going to trigger our second Lambda function, and it's going to give, us, uh, give it the uh, JSON payload. And the when when a topic publishes to a um, sorry when a, a subscribing function um, gets a data from that uh, SNS topic. The data is actually embedded quite a few levels in, so there's the data that it got from Slack, which means that it can now grab the useful information that it wants, which is the response URL and the channel ID and the text. So the response URL is the um, URL that, that the function can use to send a message back to, um, back to the user. Uh, the channel ID is where the uh, app has been invoked, which channel it's been invoked from, and the text is the, that parameter value that has been, um, so the search string. Our function's going to use that search string to do a get request to Jamf um, 
and, and, and look for any, and get back from Jamf any matching, any matching computer records. Uh, so here I am just uh, a, a, appending that search string to that, um, to that URL and then using the request module to, um, to do the get request. So Jamf uh, responds with some JSON data and look, I'm not going to go into how to format a message for Slack. I think that it's that's a whole nother session. Um, but <laughs> here I am, just uh, grabbing the data from that I'm, I'm getting as a response from from Jamf, and then I'm looping through the results, and I'm creating an attachments array. So an attachment is going to be that block that you see, which has the information about the computer and the button. And so it's just looping through and creating one for each result that it gets. Uh, that response URL is the URL that it's going to send the information to. And the main uh, text of the message is going to be uh, information about the total number of results. And then the rest of the message is going to be the list of um, computers. And we send that data off uh, to Slack as JSON in JSON format. And here we go. There's the result there. Um, when the user clicks a button, the workflow is essentially exactly the same. So Slack sends some URL encoded text. And we send it through. Our Lambda function receives it. Oops. Um, this time, when it receives that payload from Slack about a button click, it's actually completely different to what it receives from the uh, command being invoked. Uh, what this means is that the process of converting this data to JSON format is going to be different. So it requires us to do a little bit of uh, remove payload equals from, from the um, payload and then do some um, percent uh, decoding. So now that we've got it in JSON format, we can respond back with a status code of 200 and trigger that second SNS topic, which then uh, triggers the uh, fourth Lambda function in our workflow. This Lambda function is going to do a serial number lookup. So I forgot to mention, but that button there, when it gets clicked, the value uh, assigned to that button is the serial number of the computer in the results, which means that our Lambda function knows exactly which computer that it wants the results from. And it gets the um, response from Jamf and goes through it, grabs the attributes that it wants, formats it into some Slack-friendly JSON, and the results get um, sent through to Slack. Um, on the Jamf side of things, I needed to figure out early on what information I wanted to include in the summary um, and how I was going to obtain this information. So extension attributes are particularly useful uh, because, as I found out, you can um, put emojis in there. So it made it a lot easier for, um, for, for me to put that logic in the extension attribute as to whether a value is considered a good value or a bad value. Um, and also, the other thing was smart groups. Uh, showing if a Mac belongs to a particular smart group is quite helpful um, because you can put some complicated nested logic in your smart group, um, uh, which if you try to do in Python, it would just be a massive pain and, and, and very difficult to update. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to um, include in my summary was the last check-in and inventory update times. I think that um, to know that there's been an inventory update in the last 24 hours, or in, in our environment's case, um, we've got a check-in every 15 minutes, that's usually a very good indicator of the health of the max Jamf enrollment. Um, so I thought it was important to um, make sure to include that in the, in the Mac health summary. All in all, I needed to not only consider what attributes I wanted to display, what emojis I wanted to um, indicate uh, health status, um, 
I also needed to consider what order I wanted this information to be displayed in and if order actually mattered. Um, and then also the efficiency of gathering the information. So, for example, at the start I thought, oh, I'll just create an extension attribute that has the whole health summary information so that my Lambda function only just has to grab the content of that one extension attribute. Um, but what that meant was that I would, every time that an, a computer does an inventory update, it's not only doing the um, the standard extension attributes that I'm using for the Jamf Pro console and for smart group logic and, and everything else, it also was doing, it was doubling up on, on looking up this information and, and, and running um, uh, the extension attribute scripts. Um, so those are the things to consider and I try to optimise where possible. So this is an extension attribute, an example of the file vault extension attribute. Um, fairly straightforward. I'm uh, just checking to see if the Mac is file vault enabled. Um, the, the real one also checks for not only whether, whether it's enabled, but confirms that the primary user is a file vault enabled user and confirms that the, um, the local tech account that we have on our Macs is also file vault enabled. Um, so as you can see, you've got emojis embedded in there. And that's what it looks like in the Jamf Pro console. And then on the Lambda side of things, I don't actually care about the results of that, the value of that particular extension attribute. I just care about the extension attribute ID, which means that I'm just looping through. And then if it's the ID of, in this case, 31, then I'm going to format it format the string, which means just stripping out any empty lines and also adding um, just a, a slight indentation so that it looks better in Slack. Um, and then if there's no value because that extension attribute hasn't been run yet on that particular machine, uh, then I'm just going to let the, the tech know. And so all I'm doing is appending that extension attribute value to a long string of extension attribute values. And that's what it looks like in the Slack Mac summary. Uh, for smart group membership, uh, unfortunately, um, you can't determine a smart group by ID. You have to determine it by the smart group name. Um, what this means is that I am looping through all the uh, groups that this particular Mac is a member of, and I'm looking for a the particular name of the smart group. And so in this case, if it's a member of the boot drive more than, it's, uh, I'm going to display a sad emoji in the, in the summary. Uh, and this is an example of it in real life. And as you can see, this particular Mac has a lot of problems. And isn't it great that you can look at that and in the half a second it takes you to look at all that, see those warning emojis, you can see that it's a Mac that has a lot of problems. If you were to look at this particular Mac in the Jamf Pro console, it's going to take you a little, bit of, um, a little bit of time, a little bit of experience and effort to make the same assessment. Um, so to calculate whether the last check-in was in the last 15 minutes, I grab the last contact date in epoch time, I then get the current uh, time in epoch time. Um, just to note, uh, Jamf considers epoch in milliseconds, whereas the time module considers it in seconds, so I'm just making the current time, current epoch time times in it by 1,000, and then looking at the difference between the two. And then I'm putting in a sad emoji if it's more than 15 minutes. Oh, and times, uh, dividing it by 60,000 to get it into minutes. Um, so considering the nature of the information that I'm accessing to, uh, with this app, uh, obviously a lot of security measures need to be put into place. So I've made sure that the command only works when run from a particular private channel that only the tech team is a member of. I'm also verifying that the request is uh, coming from Slack and not from someone pretending to be Slack. Um, and I'm making sure that the request is fairly fresh, uh, that it's uh, at maximum uh, five minutes old. I'm also making sure that the Jamf Pro API credentials that I'm using have uh, just the minimum permissions required for, for this particular workflow. I'm making sure that any sensitive information, any passwords aren't hard-coded into the Lambda function. And I'm making sure that that particular, the SNS topic can only be published and subscribed to by the Lambda functions that, that I define. 
So when Slack is sending through that post request, that URL encoded data, this is what you're actually getting. Um, and this is a request from, the Slack, uh, from a Slash command. Um, so down here, you're getting the channel ID value. And so what we want to do is we want to confirm what channel ID it is that we are limiting the app to. Uh, you find out your Slack channel ID, uh, the, the, the best way to do it or the easiest way to do it is to just log into Slack from a browser, navigate to the channel that you're interested in and then look at the URL. Um, it's an alphanumeric string about eight characters long. Uh, and then here in my function, I'm just making sure that the channel ID that the request came from is actually the channel that, um, that I need it to be. And if not, I'm returning some, some information to the user. And that information is like that, just letting them know that they're not invoking the app from an authorised channel. Uh, so Slack creates a unique string for your app um, that it only shares with you as the app developer. And so you can verify each request is coming from app by computing a signature with each request and verifying that it matches one of the header values that comes in with that request. Um, that means that the signature is unique for each request and it doesn't contain any secret information. And um, as Slack say, uh, signing secrets are considered the cooler, fresher sibling of verification tokens. So in the Slack API console, you're going to get your signing secret. So this one is for a, um, one of the apps. And from that post request that you get sent, you're going to see two headers of note. Number one is the timestamp. Number two is that Slack signature um, header. So in our function, what we're going to do is we're going to create a base string, which is going to concatenate the uh, timestamp, the, uh, the request body. And then it's going to delimit it with a colon, and it's going to add the string v0 equals at the very start. And it's going to grab the signing secret that you know to be true and it's going to then, uh, then create a hash of this base string using that signing secret as the key. Then what you're going to do is you're going to compare it to, the, um, to what's been sent, delivered in the signing secret header, uh, Slack signature um, header value, and you're going to compare it, and if they don't match, you're going to respond with a code of 412, or at least I did in my case, uh, which is just a precondition failed status code. Uh, in addition, I'm grabbing the timestamp, which is in epoch time, uh, comparing it to the current time, and just making sure that the message is no more than uh, three, 300 seconds old. Um, on the Jamf Pro uh, side of things, I'm just making sure that, that the credentials that I'm using only have read access to computer objects, and then that's it. You don't need any other, um, any other permissions. So to make sure that I'm not hard coding any credentials or sensitive information, I'm using an AWS service called Secrets Manager. Um, it allows you to store and access uh, your secret keys uh, on the fly. Um, and the, the, the secrets that you can store are the Jamf API credentials, so both the username and the password, the Slack signing secret, and anything else, like the channel ID, for example. Um, and you just retrieve the values on the fly. I would like to just point out something that can trip you up. So that um, execution role, so that particular role that we created for the Lambda function and to access the SNS topic, you have to also give it access to read um, secrets from Secrets Manager. That can trip you up if you're wondering why your get requests to Jamf Pro aren't working. It'll be because it can't actually retrieve the, uh, the secret, the, um, the username and password for the, for the, for the call. This is the code that retrieves the secret. In this case, we're retrieving the username and password for uh, Jamf all sites read. Um, 
I'm not going to go into this at all because Secrets Manager is very helpful. As soon as you create a secret, it's going to give you some code snippets in Python for how to retrieve your, um, that particular secret. So it's pretty, this is just a copy and paste job, really. Uh, the last thing we want to do is to lock down the topic so it can only be accessed by the role that we've created for the app. Um, otherwise, by default, any SNS topic that you create can be accessed by any other resource as long as they know the, the ARN. Um, and so we just uh, edit the access policy for, for that particular topic and we set the principle to be your role, that the, the app role that, the, that you created. So this means that only this role can access um, the SNS topic. Something else to consider is helper text for your users if they enter no parameter values or if they enter um, the word help, for example. Um, so here we're just um, converting the, the request to JSON and um, we're trying to assign that parameter value to our um, variable search string. Um, and if it fails, it's because there's no parameter value there. Um, and then here, down there, I'm saying if it's empty or if the word, the search string is help, then send back a response um, with the helper text. This is an example of what our helper text looks like. Um, so hopefully pretty clear as to what you can do. And that reminds me, I forgot to mention that uh, although I did talk about asterisks in the search string, you can have wildcards in that search string. Um, another thing to look out for is that by default, Lambda functions are set to timeout after three seconds. Uh, so the Lambda function that's doing all the API, API lookups and all, all that, you know, all the, the, the grunt work, um, three seconds is probably not going to be enough before it gets terminated by AWS. So just make sure that you increase that um, uh, so you don't get it a, a, have it timeout. Um, I've, I've found that six seconds is usually enough. Something else to consider is that there's a maximum of 100 attachments per message, but Slack really want you to limit it to 20. And so in, in my code, if the results are more than 20 machines, I actually just um, send back to the users, um, letting them know that they need to be a bit more specific with their search string. That response URL that your app can use to um, send messages back to the user uh, can only be invoked up to five times and within 30 minutes. So just take that into account when you're designing your workflow. Last thing I want to point out is the fact that the, um, the payload that you get from Slack from a slash command being invoked uh, compared to when a button is clicked, compared to when a uh, SNS topic has been triggered, is going to be completely different. So highly recommend that if you're new to this and, 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 and want to look into this further, that you start off with um, maybe an app that simply writes back to Slack the content that it's receiving from that particular resource or from that particular invocation. Um, it'll save you a, a, a lot of headache as as you go on. Um, so I'm still in the early stages of using this app at Seek. Uh, I think that it's got a lot of potential to streamline our workflow. A um, couple of things that I can see as improvements is you could, in theory, have, apart from that more info button, have a install software button, um, which would then display a, a list of software that, um, that you have a license for, but it still requires like managerial approval or, or some sort of technical um, pre-approval before it gets installed. And each software can have a button that when you click it, is sending to your Lambda function the serial number of the computer that's getting the software and the name of the software. And then all you're doing on the Lambda function side of things is adding that computer to a static group that is scoped in the policy that installs the software. Um, another thing that I can see as an improvement is giving the ability for certain attributes that require further investigation to um, either have a button or a link to documentation that explains to the tech exactly uh, what is wrong and how to potentially resolve the issue. 
So um, I saw this. I saw this tweet a couple of days ago, and it really spoke to me. Um, I think this is a this is a retroactive disclaimer that um, this. I've just fumbled my way through this. I've just Googled my way into having a working app, um, and so I do wonder if the reaction <laughs> to seeing some of my code has been like that. Um, Having said that, I am more than happy to talk with anyone about what I, pr I presented today in further detail, if you'd like. I never update my blog, but I will be putting these slides up and also including links to all the resources that I used to create the app. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening, and hopefully speak to you soon. Bye. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tanya. That was awesome. Um, if, if that's what your code looks like, nobody ever look at any of my code. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have time for... I think we've got time for maybe one or two questions, if you're, if you're OK. Otherwise, yep. feel that's free to speak fine. to Tanya. So, does anybody have any questions for Tanya? Is it about my Python code, Tony? <laughs> no, no, it's not, no, it's not about your Python code at all. I, I totally refuse to comment on the quality of anybody's code <laughs> for the same reason as Marcus. Um, yeah, I was just wondering why, uh, um, when you're specifying the specific computer, are you choosing the serial number rather than the JSS ID? Um, just because. <laughs> It's it just could the be. J, the JSS I don't... ID is guaranteed to be unique, while serial number isn't. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. I actually started with the computer name to begin with, so I wasn't being very smart or efficient about it at all. But yes, JSS ID is guaranteed to be unique. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I will write yeah, that I down. <laughs> there were no good reason. <laughs> Are there alternatives to like? building this out without AWS or stuff like that? Yeah, you can run your own server. As long as you've got an, um, you just need that API for Slack to know who to send the request to. And then you can do the, the, the rest is totally up to you. So AWS, look, t to be honest, I wasn't, I wasn't being completely honest when I said that I was looking at the most efficient and effective way to help the level one, level two techs. It was that, and then also a, a big part was me wanting to practice using some AWS services that are used <laughs> in our environment. So it was, uh, there was, there was you know, um, personal motivation there. Uh, so yes, absolutely anything could be used instead. As long as you give Slack that URL, you're, you're good to go. Um, this is a question more for the, the room. Um, I love Slack, uh, but we're cheap and we use Teams. Um, uh, is there a, a good guide that anyone, anyone knows about you know, converting really cool uh, Slack apps into Teams apps? Get Slack. Is there a response behind me? Yeah, I know, I know. Crickets. <laughs> can, can, we, can we pipe Teams into Slack to then do it, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. This is awesome. This is seriously awesome. I love how this all comes together. My question has more to do with um, starting to think about budgeting for this kind of thing. I, how expensive are your Lambda requests? How expensive is a bot like this to run in AWS, generally speaking? Um, oh, sorry, I think, oh, thank you. Uh, so I tried to actually get, I had a slide on AWS costs, and I tried to find out what the cost was, and it was too small for our, um, so we're looking at cents per month, it's minimal, um, and yeah, it's super cheap. And the great thing about Slack and AWS is that you can create your own workspace and uh, a completely private, personal testing workspace, and AWS, you create your own AWS account just for testing this sort of stuff out. Yeah.